Milton begins Paradise Lost with a, a plea to God that he may find fit audience, though few. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we are. So here you are, fit audience, though few. Um, I decided to do formation on the off days like Columbus Day weekend just because I get bored and, uh, and uh, as, as many as pe people as want to come can come. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a devotee of Ignatius Loyola. That's the center of my spirituality. And I know some of you are interested, in, uh, very interested in that spirituality. So the first thing I want to say is it's totally the opposite of anything Father Chris tells you. He tells you to sit in silence and not have thoughts. And I tell you to sit and have thoughts. Uh, and discern the thoughts. And it's not that one is wrong and the other is right. It's just whatever fits you, and particularly whatever fits you in the right time in your life. Um, <clears throat> some wise person, I don't know who, once said, that Benedictine spirituality, which is the spirituality very much behind contemplative spirituality, is a spirituality of the countryside. And Franciscan spirituality, which is really a spirituality of service, is a spirituality for the village. You go into the village and you, you find the poor and you serve the poor. And Ignatian spirituality is the spirituality of the city. It's a spirituality for people who are around of lots of noise. Ignatius Loyola, and that's basically what he looked like, that's an actual portrait of him, uh, at least based on the previous portrait. Ignatius was a knight. Uh, he was a soldier, and he, he led, uh, led a, a life of Glory, honor, and sex. And he found that glory, honor, and sex just didn't quite fulfill what he was yearning for. That whenever he spent the night with a, a, a lovely court, a courtesan, that somehow he would wake up the next morning, he still wouldn't be satisfied. So he began to ask, what is it that my soul is yearning for? What is it that my soul is, is after? And this fits very well with today's gospel, which is the rich young man and Father Chris's sermon and Alex telling you to double your pledge. Uh, so Ignatius says, what, what is it that I, I need to be satisfied and how do I know that? And he developed through his spiritual act, uh, exercises a process of discernment which is used by many people today, they even teach the spiritual exercises to Buddhists, to uh, addicts, uh, teach them every place. Because they're a process of listening to the voices inside your head, which Ignatius often calls the good angel and the evil angel. Now, do you have any of those voices inside your head? In Lent, what happens to me if I swear off chocolate, wine, and cashews? <laughs> there's always this voice that's saying to me, cashews, <laughs> chocolate. And this other voice is saying, no, no cashews, no chocolate. Now that's a moment of discernment. It really is. It's like so many other moments in our lives where we have one voice telling us to go this way and another voice telling us to go that way. When I decided to come to Chicago uh, from Nashville, my wife got an offer to be the director of communication for the women of the ELCA. And it was going to cost, and, and I, uh, I was actually ordained in Chicago, so it was my diocese. Uh, Father Chris and I can both tell you stories of the then Bishop of Tennessee, who was, who was the, the voice of the evil angel. <laughs> but we had to make a decision. Do we take huge cuts in our salary and just go off and leave family and 
parish and church and go take it. And I just had to find any job. And that's what I actually did was find any job. Uh, or would we stay where we were? What was the call? What was the way we would move? So we practiced this very easy discernment process. On a Saturday night, on a Friday night, we sat out on our deck and started drinking wine. <laughs> and by the end of the evening, we decided this is the stupidest thing one could possibly do. I mean, look, we're just giving up our lives to go chase what, we don't even know what. She didn't even want the job. And so, no, we're definitely not going to do it. The next night, we sat out on the deck and started drinking another bottle of wine. And then we seriously started talking about where is God calling us to be. Now, we were still drinking wine, notice, but it wasn't clouding our head. And we decided, we decided that we would pray about it, we would think about it, and at the end of the next week, we would make a decision. And the decision would have to do with how we understood this call. <clears throat> Obviously, we decided that the call of God was to come here, to come to Chicago. So the first thing we do when, when you start thinking about Ignatian discernment, you ask, well, what kind of person am I really? Well, ask yourself this as we talk a little this morning. What kind of person are you? Are you a person of whim and impulse? Is that, is that your demon? Do you ever kind of walk into an automobile showroom and you get this overwhelming rush that somehow you need a new car. For me, it's going into the Apple store. <laughs> and I know I have a perfectly good pebble watch that works with my iPhone, but it is not color and does not have a touch screen. And one day I'm going to walk in there and my breathing is going to get shorter. I mean, it's, it's, and I'm going to have this rush and then I'm going to have to discern. Do I follow my whim? In that case, I'm a person of whim. Are you a person of law and rules? My wife is a person of whim, but she is also in charge of our weekly budget. And she is a person of law. So as soon as my whim tells me to go spend 600 bucks on this iWatch, Apple Watch, She's going to say, it's not in the budget. I don't care what you say. <laughs> you turned 75 in five years. <laughs> you can have it for your 75th birthday, but not now. <laughs> any of you live with people like that or any of you like that? I can't do this. It is not on my diet. Cashews. Chocolate. Or... And here's the challenging thing. Are you a person of religious faith? That is, when you make important decisions, do you make them by a rule of faith? Because all of us are to some degree people of whim, and some of us are of some degree of pe people of law. <clears throat> so if you sift through yourself, the, one of the best tests of faith Faith, I know, is in Ignatius Loyola's principle and foundation of discernment. The human person is created to praise, reverence, and serve our Lord, and by doing so, to save his or her soul. By which Ignatius means your total person, your ultimate fulfillment, becoming the unique human being that you are. Now, does chocolate save my soul? <laughs> Does an apple watch save my soul? What about that whatever Lexus hybrid my spouse is convinced we need? When we only have 75,000 miles on the car she has, and it's a perfectly good car. First of rules there, see? <laughs> that is, to attain the ultimate fulfillment of the unique person God created, to find our true self. It is for the human person 
that the other things on the face of the earth are created as helps to the pursuit of that end. So, to love and serve God is your whole purpose, and everything else in the world, everything else in the world, is only to help you toward that end, or hinder you toward that end. But the problem is, it follows that, that the person has to use these things insofar as they are a help toward that end and to be free of them insofar as they stand in the way of loving and serving God. That's what Ignatians call holding everything loosely. Uh -huh. I'm holding like this. Hold like this. Uh, and here he's bor borrowing from St. Augustine of Hippo who says, <laughs> we are cre created all to serve and love God and everything in creation is created only to be used only to be used but the problem is we get confused and we use God and we love things so now if my wife won't bed I'm going to go start praying for that Apple watch <laughs> No better case of using God than that. <clears throat> and every good Ignatian and every good Buddhist, here the Ignatians, the Buddhists are alike, talk about unhealthy attachments. To attain this, we need to make ourselves indifferent toward all created things, provided the matter is subject to our free choice. To be indifferent to all created things. Indifferent, meaning not overvaluing. Not undervaluing or overvaluing. Thus, for our part, we should not want health more than sickness. <clears throat> not a person in this room wants sickness over health. Right? Wealth more than poverty. Not a person in this room wants poverty. Fame more than disgrace. Not a person in this room wants to be disgraced. And he was a knight. He was a soldier. A long life, not a long live, a long life more than a short one. As with everything else, desiring and choosing only that which conduces more to the end that we were created to love and serve God. Okay. If you're going to be a Jesuit, you get stuck with that. The rest of us can only look at it and say, what do I overvalue? What am I so attached to that if it were taken from me, I couldn't let it go? Notice Jesus is really tough on this. In today's gospel, he'll say, give up your money, or something. Okay. All right. I can imagine that. I can kind of imagine going to a monastery. At least when I'm dead, Kush, it's all going to charity. When I'm dead. <laughs> but family? Children? Husband? Do I value my wife more than I value God? Is my wife an idol in my life? If she suddenly vanished on her way back from Florida yesterday, what would it do to me? There is that deep and abiding fear that I would not know how to live without her. So this is tough. You ever wonder how those Jesuits could go to South America and climb cliffs and get killed by the Portuguese and the, the Spanish? How they could go to India? How they could go uh, to China? I mean, you know, they uh, when when the Roman Catholic Church got locked out of North America, I mean North Northern Europe by the Reformation, they said, "Hey, let's just go to China." They took over the rest of the world. That's why they're 
more of them than anything else in the world. So all right, we'll, we'll concede Northern Europe. You can have, you can have Northern Germany, that's all right. You can have all of England. We'll just go take India. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what does it mean to be indifferent? <clears throat> that is the question. means essentially that one's faith in God is ultimate, the ultimate value and nothing should supersede it. I consider myself a person of faith. But faith is just one aspect of my life. You don't go to China when it's just one aspect of your life. If you didn't notice it by now, all my sermons are to me. Because I'm, I'm the greatest sinner in this room, I will tell you. I'm worse than any of you, and you're all bad. <laughs> Anything that supersedes God is an idol. Oh, you know, the market economy is also an idol for me. I really hate it when the market goes down. I can get depressed. I can think... I've been robbed. I have been robbed by those idiots. <laughs> Idols may include money, prestige, family, health and fitness, gadgets. Oh, health and fitness. Some of you, I know, are out there punishing yourselves. <laughs> gadgets, food. Oh, there's another one of mine. I live in downtown Oak Park. I can hardly get home without walking past a sidewalk cafe or, or a dozen. And everybody's got a happy hour now. You know, <laughs> this is not good. This is not good. A $5 martini, and a, you know, you have two of those, and then you're going to stay and eat dinner. <laughs> The bottom line, you should not overvalue any created thing. Ignatius is not an ascetic. He believes in living in this world, but he believes in not overvaluing things. So the question is, when we start overvaluing things, he says, that's when we start making wrong decisions. I don't know how many times I've gone through an Ignatian process with somebody who was offered a job they really didn't want, that paid a lot more, and they decided they, they shouldn't take it as they went through the listening to the voices in their head. And then a week later, they came back and told me they took it. I got a friend who did that. He, he regrets it to this day, and I'll never let him forget it. I said, you know, you're just like the guy who comes out of the AA meeting after 12 years sober and takes a right turn into a bar. So if you go through this process, that's the bottom line you start on. And then, and I've got a, I, I'll post this on the web. That's a, a web address for, uh, there's some really good Ignatian resources out there. One called Dot Magus, Dot Magus, M-A-G-I-S. And Ignatius says, now you get very specific about this. And almost all of you have done processes like this. He tells you to make lists. Put the pros and the cons. But here's the funny thing. After you put the pros and the cons, you think about it. Pros are and cons, whose voice is which? Uh, this would make me grow as a person, but it would cut my income. Good angel, the evil angel. Uh, after you do, do that, he says, now take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. That's all. Every time you do part of this process, take it to the Lord. Uh, you formulate the issue very specifically. Uh, you find a passage in the Gospels that deals with the choice you have to make. A uh, rich young man today uh, is a good example. He's got to make, he wants Jesus to reaffirm him about his life choices. And he is a person of law, and he has kept the law. So, um, and if you read the Gospel like an Ignatian, you know, there are different ways of reading Scripture. An Ignatian meditation, if you go to meditate with Father Chris, you go off, 
you close your eyes, you sit there in utter silence, and every time you have a thought, you go back to your mantra. You're trying not to have thoughts, and that's a good way to be in contact with, with God. But in Ignatian meditation, you read a passage from Scripture, and then you put yourself in the passage. And you use your imagination to imagine where you would be in today's scripture. Who would you be in today's scripture? We all know the rich young man comes and says, Jesus, what a, a good master. What do I have to do to, to inherit eternal life, which means full life, a life to its fullest? And he says, well, we'll obey the law. Well, I've done that. Ah, oh, one thing you lack. Go sell all that you have, get it from the poor, and come follow me. My, my brother-in-law is, is, is he's a wonderful person. He's also obscenely wealthy, uh, but he shares it very well with us. Um, he, um, he, 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 he's, a, he's a Baptist and a scriptural literalist, so I always play this game of, with him about what, what do you take literally in scripture? And when we get down to this one, I say, well, is this literal or is it symbolic, figurative? He'll always say, well, it's figurative because my possessions don't get in my way. And I always say, are you sure? <laughs> uh, so where would you be in that passage today? I read an interesting Ignatian meditation on that passage. And it's a... The, the person doing the meditation is the rich young man some years later. And he's, he's going through the fact that his life hadn't been exactly fulfilling. It hasn't been a bad life. But he says, I wonder what if, what would have happened if. The first thing I say to Jesus is, good master. And he says, why do you call me good? What if I had stuck why do I call him good? What is good in you? Would that have changed my life? Instead of saying, okay, what else do I need to do? I keep the law. Good master, why do you call me good? The feeding of 5,000, I did an Ignatian meditation on that one time, and I put myself, they're, they're, they're the inner circle, and then they're the mass, and I put myself right on the edge of the inner circle. Not quite inside. And that was a revelation to me. Not quite one of the twelve. Not quite one of the crowd. The priest of the Episcopal Church. Pray for openness to the will of God and freedom from prejudice and addic addiction. That's a tough one, isn't it? Be aware of your disordered affections or your inordinate attachments, which translates addictive compulsive behavior. Do your research. Talk to people. Consult with friends. List advantages and disadvantages and pray and then pray some more. One of my Jesuit teachers, uh, <coughs> Father Bill Creed, um, who does the twelve? Uh, who does the, the spiritual exercises with a, uh, with addicts and alcoholics? Tells a story about a nun who was sent to the Jesuits on, for this retreat because she was she was such a pain, <coughs> such a pain in the rear to her congregation. She was always angry and disruptive, and she thought she was being discriminated against. And everything. And so finally her superior sends her to this <laughs> Ignatian retreat. If you do the spiritual exercises in the right way, which nobody ever really does, you spend 30 days doing this with a spiritual director. There are other ways to do it. You can take a year and do it a little bit every morning. Uh, and so Bill, Bill said I would meet with her uh, and she would talk to me about how unhappy she was and how terrible she felt and how other people didn't like her and how unhappy she was in the convent. And he would say, every day I would say to her, sister, take that to the Lord. And she'd come back in the next day and she'd be down and depressed and angry and she'd tell him again and again how much she hated this 
He said, well, sister, I just take that to the Lord. He said, after 26 days, she came in one morning. He said, how are you, sister? She said, I'm wonderful. I don't have a problem in this world. Well, that's wonderful, sister. What did you do? She said, you know, I took all my anxiety and grief to the Lord, and I, I'm just a new person today. It took her 26 days. And by then, she didn't even realize he was saying that to her every time. Every time he was saying that to her. So pray, 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 pray. <laughs> uh, and attend to the movements in your heart, the voices in your head, the messages of others throughout the day. You hear several people saying the same thing to you. You know, you've got, you ever thought about, you ever thought about spiritual direction? You seem to have a real spiritual yearning. Two or three people say that to you. Take it seriously. Take it really seriously. And whenever you lean toward a decision, will it lead you to your true self? Pay attention to whether you feel in Ignatian's terms desolation or consolation. That's right. The fruit of of, of You've got a good and evil angel, and, you know, they're not all good and they're not all evil. And you have really two spiritual states in Ignatius. You have these times of desolation where you're feeling lost, like that sister, where you're feeling that you don't fit, where you're feeling you can't do anything right, and you never make a decision in desolation. You only make decisions you feel the presence of God and your true self speaking through. Whoa, how did that happen? <laughs> His first rule is of discernment is for those motivated by sin in persons who go from mortal sin to mortal sin, which was him, the night. The enemy is commonly used to propose to them apparent pleasures. Oh, this will feel so good. Making them imagine sensual delights and pleasures in order to hold them more and make them grow in their vices and their sin. In these persons, the good spirit uses the opposite method, pricking them and biting their consciousness through the process of reason. Oh, Bob, figure it out. <laughs> you really don't want to do this. Figure it out. This is not going to end any place but bad. The second rule is for those who are willing then, after being pricked by the good angel, in persons who are cleansing their sins and rising from good to better in the service of God it is the way of the evil spirit to fight, sadden, and put obstacles, disquieting with false reasons that one may not go on. And it is proper to the good to give courage and strength, consolation, tears, inspiration, and quiet, easing and putting away all obstacles that one may go on in well-doing. So, if you're, if you're moving away from sin, it's the evil angel who keeps pricking you. <laughs> the good angel keeps consoling you. If you're staying in sin, and basically sin is anything that denies love of God and love of other people. It's not eating cashews. That's, that's, that's only when we take Lent to be a to be a, a self-improvement project. I need to quit wine and cashews so I'll lose weight. You know, And that's my offering to God for this Lent. <laughs> the third rule, and there are 14 of these rules I'm not giving you all of. Spiritual Exercise is a pretty good sized book. It is written in a kind of off-putting way in that this is a 16th century knight. So he writes in chivalric terms. And, uh, but but they're, they're good translations of it. Uh, I call it consolation, but in flame with the love of the Creator and Lord above all created things. The tears move us to the Lord, whether out of sorrow for one's sins or for the passion of Christ our Lord, 
or because of other things directly connected with his service and praise. Finally, I call consolation. Every increase of hope, faith, and charity, and all interior joy. That's the bottom line there. Hope, faith, charity, and all interior joy. We're into stewardship time. And, you know, everybody's got a story about how good they feel when they give stuff away. Because it can increase hope and faith and char charity and give one genuinely a joyful countenance. <clears throat> I already mentioned the fourth rule. Uh, I call desolation the contrary of the, of the third, which is faith, hope, and love, such as darkness of the soul, disturbance, movement to things low and earthly, agitations, temptations, because as consolation is contrary to desolation, in the same way the thoughts which come from consolation are contrary to the thoughts of desolation. And in times of desolation, never make a change. Ignatius Loyola and other spiritual guides did not know of clinical depression, but they knew what it was like to be down. So I would call desolation not necessarily clinical depression. They knew suicide, but it, it's what it's like to be down in the dumps. The feeling that nothing I'm doing matters. That my life has no purpose. That there's no real reason to go to work this morning. I really hate what I'm doing. Now don't quit your job at that time. <laughs> That's what Ignatian tells you. <clears throat> He has stages of growth which first start with sin and sinfulness. And remember, that's holding on to things that you're supposed to use, not loving God. The call to Christ, the call to follow Christ, he calls it the call to, of the standard of Christ, meaning Christ's battle flag, because he was a soldier. Um, the call, so the call to compassion, and finally, the call to contemplation. The call to Christ, you feel vulnerable, you feel loved, you discover yourself, you have new energy, you follow the commandments, you do good. And from that springs a sense of compassion, which also includes feeling powerless. Betrayal of the world. Suffering. Union with those who suffer. You know, in this country, we do love to blame people. We are a culture full of blame. If somebody don't have what we think they ought to have, we think it's their fault. And then comes contemplation, great boy, peace, filled with potential, alive, in the spirit, in union with Christ. Now, I'm going to show you something. It's not in the slideshow. I have to close my <laughs> laptop. It's my screensaver. Yeah. My screensaver, back in last December, Terry and I took a trip to Barcelona. And outside Barcelona is a mountain which a lot, particularly of women, a lot of women, Hispanic women, are named Montserrat. Here's Montserrat. It's a solitary mountain. And the serrat in Mont Serrat means serrated, like a serrated knife. And at the top of Mount Serrat is a monastery. It's a Benedictine monastery. And at this monastery is a statue, miraculous and famous statue, called the Black Virgin of Mont Serrat. And it was at the statue of the Black Virgin of Mont Serrat, which sits up above the high altar uh, of the chapel that Ignatius Loyola laid down his sword. He came to the Black Virgin and laid down his sword. That was his huge act of <coughs> surrender. And if you stand there and you look out, you can see the Pyrenees in the distance, and they're snow-capped most of the time. Well, 
Uh, Terry and I went up there right before Christmas. So we, we spent, it was an ignition moment for me because I spent the first week of the trip visiting my old friends in Paris. Now, what did I do in Paris? Did I lead a spiritual life befitting of a monk? No. <laughs> I, I led a life filled with food and fun and wine and, oh, there's nothing quite like Paris at Christmas. You know, it's just nothing like, uh, like uh, walking the streets of, 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 of Paris. And my, I've got a friend who's the pastor at uh, La Madeleine, the church that looks like the Parthenon. And it's not too far down the street from Galerie Lafayette, which you can go and, and get really distracted by all the goodies there. And then I went to Barcelona. Barcelona is a wonderful city. Let's see if I get it. That is Montserrat. And they say it is was built by the angels. Oops, <laughs> you don't have it? What happened? We'll start at the beginning. <laughs> it's making enough noise. So just turn it around so we can see it. Okay, I'm going to have to close it again though because the sign on the screen came up. Tell, don't tell me. Oh no, it's my sign on screen. Yeah, that, is that it? That is it. <laughs> Just when you came up. Uh, the one I actually ha have on, on the front is uh, doesn't have us in there. But you can see the serrated mountains. <laughs> and I believe it was built by the angel. I don't believe this was a process of volcanic eruption and, and, uh, and uh, uh, erosion at all. I believe this was built by the angel. And I'm sticking by that. And if you call me irrational, I will plead guilty. Uh, any questions? We've got well, 10 minutes or so. You're all looking at that picture. <laughs> You're contemplatives. How long does it take to become a Jesuit? Isn't that a longer process? Than it, it's, it's a long process. It is varied over the years. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's about a 10-year process, and almost all of them have highly advanced degrees, or almost all PhDs or MDs or something of that sort, because they are, they are the intellectual troublemakers of the Roman Church. Uh, I've had Jesuit spiritual directors for a long time. And they're, they're kind of famous for their, their ability to get around the, rule of, the rules of the church and the rules of the law. Uh, they have an ethical theory called probabilism that is very controversial in the Roman church, always, always been. And when I explain to you, you'll see why the Pope, the people of Rome don't like it. It's basically if you can find any probability that an action is allowed, any, any probability, even a small one, you're urged to go in the direction of freedom. That is, it takes overwhelming evidence that you must follow the rules to convict you to follow the rules. So it's a 
it's, it's regarded as a pretty, well, you can find something in the Bible. So, well, you know, there are people in the Bible who got divorces. Well, we don't have to follow that rule on divorce then, see? Uh, because in the, in the tradition or in, in legal history, if you can find a reason not to follow the law, you're not bound by the law. Probabilism, probabiliarism, and equal probabilism were, as I recall, the three uh, positions. Uh, some people try to be a little stricter and say, well, you've got to be equally probable that you should, should follow the law. Um, but they, they don't wear monastic outfits. They don't live in convents. Uh, they often teach. Um, but but they, they were and still remain great missionaries. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie The Mission uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, their exploits were amazing. They were always involved in some kind of intrigue, so people don't trust them. Um, uh, I've never, and actually the Jesuits I know are, are really very kind people and very easy people. I used to uh, eat at their house occasionally, you know, up at Oak Park. They usually live two or three or four of them together in a, in a very, usually a very nice house. They're not a poor order. And the one thing that struck me was what a lonely life they lived. If any of their four or five friends that they live with are away, this is their family. And they don't have any family outside of that. That's almost true of the Roman priesthood in general. It's a very lonely life because they can't really be with parishioners however much they might like to. They can't be really friends with parishioners the way we can be because their life is so different. So anybody want to go on a Jesuit 30-day uh, uh. retreat? <laughs> Diane's ready to go. It's a great thing to do in retirement when you've already gotten rid of a lot of those attachments. You know? Uh, when you don't really need a job, it's a great, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's a, when you don't really need a job, you don't really have to take care of your kids, it gets easier, and you know, all, all Ignatius had to do was give up being a knight, which was a big deal, and all of his women, hmm. and it must have been a very solitary and difficult time for him. He was wounded uh, uh, numerous times, he was a tough guy. But you can see how his spirituality is very much a spirituality of thinking things through with a set of standards instead of principles. Well, I guess I got to go celebrate Chris's preaching, so thank you. <laughs>